Everyone feeling good? All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another installment of GridSpace Presents MIT's IAP Lectures 2023. Today's topic is conversation design. And I promise this lecture has no math, but I will endeavor to make it as interesting as possible in spite of that fact. Uh, my name is Cooper Johnson. I'm the conversation designer or voice user interface or voice user experience designer here at GridSpace. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about what I feel so lucky that I get to work on every day. So let's begin. Conversation design as a term and as, you know, an occupation really didn't exist only a handful of years ago. Um, so it's not that unusual not to know what this term means in any specific way. And it'd be pretty controversial to try to give a comprehensive definition, but I can tell you what I feel is very important about it. So at its heart, conversation design is planning, creation, iterative testing, and deployment of interactions between a human and a digital agent of some kind that are conducted in natural language. So no need for a human being to learn some, you know, some specialized jargon or, you know, specially formatted commands or even, you know, learn their way around an all new interface just conducted in, you know, the language of choice. And then the other aspect um, on the more technical side of conversation design is that we leverage a key set of technologies, which you've probably heard my colleagues from GridSpace talk about if you've watched our preceding lectures, um, to give human, uh, to give digital agents the skills in communications and decision making within a conversation that approach human ability. And you know, where we are in that approach relative to you know human fluency is a little bit subjective, but as we'll talk about a little bit later in the lecture, uh, it's taking a massive leap forward kind of as we speak. And then something important to remember about conversation design is you know ultimately its goals is that. We deploy these conversational experiences to try to meet human objectives, you know, business objectives, wanting to get something done, needing help with a product or service, goals and needs. And I don't mean needs like I need to transfer some money right now to cover my rent check. Needs um, on a more human level, like the need to feel heard, uh, the need to, um, you know, need to have a mutually satisfying um, conversation. Uh, with, so with a digital agent, just like you would with a human. So like I said before, uh, conversation design is where it all comes together. This is kind of where rubber meets the road. It is the application of some technologies that my colleagues talked about before me. And those technologies are ASR, or Automatic Speech Recognition, NLU, Natural Language Understanding, and TTS, which is our speech synthesis. So to tie that all up, Conversation designers leverage um, and know the limitations of the technologies in ASR, which means um, accounting for how well the digital agent will be able to break down the speech of the human it's talking to, identify words, knowing the limitations of NLU once the words are broken down and identified, being able to you know extract some meaning, some you know from the grammar of what they uh, what the machine hears, and then text to speech is the formulated reply which is, you know, in our case, where the machine gets a voice of its own and speaks a reply back to the human being. And if you know this very well, you might wonder, why text-to-speech? Why didn't I put in the overarching category NLG, natural language generation? After all, there are chatbots too, which count as digital agents. And there were some very specific reasons for that, but uh, we'll get to them in a second. So what are the conversational interfaces which we design conversations for? We have our text-based chatbots, and then we have, broadly speaking, our VUIs, our voice user interfaces. And as an umbrella category, voice user interfaces should be noted, does include things like IVRs, which are inter interactive voice responses. And if you've ever done business on the phone, you've probably talked to an IVR, and you know, depending on how recently the IVR was designed, that is probably a pretty unpleasant experience. You know, those are your typical, like, uh, press forward to hear these options again, or listening to some very tinny robotic sounding voice, listing off options of what it can help you with that are entirely unskippable, and it might not be clear to you, you know, what your, uh, what your task, what you know, menu item number your task falls under. So IVRs are technically voice user interfaces, but what, where the, the state of the world is now, and what we're gonna be talking about today, 
are within the category of VUIs, we're talking about voice agents or voice assistants. And there's not, those terms are pretty interchangeable, but you might think of, you know, voice assistants as being like your big names in the field, like your Siri and Alexa. And then voice agents, we tend to prefer to use that term at Gridspace for uh, our bot Grace, our bot persona Grace, because she tends to handle much longer interactions. We call them long form interactions, which require long form conversation design. So not to disparage uh, our friendly bots in the industry, Siri and Alexa, we could look at the average interaction time for you know talking to Siri or Alexa is relatively short, two to three utterances per participant, and that's it. But Grace, we are designing for you know conversations that on record have been up to 20 minutes. There are literally Grace conversations in the healthcare space that talk to real patients that have lasted up to 20 minutes, and that's because the human wanted to talk for that long, not because dealing with a voice agent was cumbersome. So that was a win because the conversation's over really when the human decides it is. So if you haven't guessed by now, this talk is on conversation design, but we'll be focusing exclusively on VUIs. And why are VUIs important? And to be clarified, that is at the expense of chatbots. No chatbot chat today. So why do we use VUIs? Because VUIs are an interface which requires no additional education to operate. People know how to speak in their language of choice. They know how to have conversations. If they can just pick up a phone, they can have a conversation with a VUI. So that's kind of the introductory material out of the way. I don't want to delve in too deeply into abstractions, but I realize also that a lot of people who are watching or listening today may not have exposure to the kind of VUI conversation, which I'm going to be talking about the design principles of which uh, for the rest of the talk. So, I am going to play an interaction between Gridspace's bot Grace and someone. And just listen carefully. This is a purely audio experience, but uh, the components of this call will kind of, you know, be a, a reference material for the rest of the talk. Hello, and thank you for calling Champions Insurance. My name is Grace. I'm a virtual agent. Am I speaking with Taylor Daniel? Uh, I'm sorry, could, could you say that again? No problem. I just asked if I'm speaking with Taylor Daniels. Oh, yeah. This is he. Wonderful. How may I help you today? Um, so I got an email from you guys that says I don't have to bother signing anything to renew my policy. I can just uh, verbally say okay instead of giving my signature. Does that make sense? Okay, great. If I understand correctly, you'd like to renew your car insurance using your voice instead of providing a signature. Do I have that right? Yep, that's it. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Did I understand the reason for your call? Yes, you did. Okay, perfect. Before I can take your voice signature, I just need to get you authenticated real quick. Could you please confirm your date of birth? March 2nd, 1990. And what are the last four digits of your social security number? 1375. Great. All right, Mr. Daniels, that information matches our records and I have you authenticated. Please give me a moment while I get all set up to accept your voice signature. All right, in order to accept uh, actually, your voice signature first, I'll read a disclosure for legal reasons. And then we'll confirm the details Grace, of your uh, new auto policy. Yeah, Grace, I have to run. Can we do this later? I'm sorry. I'm just getting called away. But I, I, I can call back and try this another time. All right. So a partial conversation, but some things to take away from that. Uh, a very business-oriented situation, trying to achieve some you know, pretty tedious administrative task. But you might have noticed that Grace let the person speak as freely as they wanted to. The person was me. I'm sure you could probably tell. Um, 
But in that, I play the role of the customer, you know, give a rambling objective. Do not just clearly say, I want to use my voice print as my legally binding signature. Rattled on about, you know, getting an email and, you know, not quite knowing, you know, what the exact terminology for what they wanted to, uh, to achieve was. And Grace listened patiently, sorted out what I wanted to do, but didn't make any assumptions about what I wanted to do. Asked to check with me first and then had to guide me through some very necessary steps to authenticate my identity so that my voice signature could be used and held my hand through the entire process. Didn't ask the questions in a vacuum. Let me know what she was going to need, what she was going to ask me and why she needed it. So those are kind of the things to think about as we go on. But a quick aside, um, it's pretty inescapable. If you're watching this talk, it's probably reached you how much the world is changing right now in the field of conversational AI. Um, VUIs are about to take a huge leap forward in their capability, and we can say that with confidence because it's already happening. We're in the middle of that leap in evolution. Uh, large language models, which you've probably seen used to such great effect in GPT-3 and chat GPT, they are coming to voice experiences, and that's very, very exciting. But the consequence is that as conversational AI takes this rapid change, the tools that we use to design conversations you know, down to the very level of writing out the dialogue for Grace to, to, to choose from and to use with human beings, those tools are changing. And, you know, mark it down. Today is February 1st, 2023. I don't want to give you any information that I feel could be out of date or require a big asterisk or two even two to four weeks from now. It's really changing that quickly. But that's really not a drawback to this talk because what it gives us more time to chat about today is the really big ideas behind conversational design. We won't get into the nitty gritty, we'll kind of keep the bird's eye view, but to me that's great because those are the more interesting aspects anyway. And just as a footnote, I don't really take any joy from this, but the consequence of all this is that we could be seeing the long foreseen death of the IVR, which I mentioned earlier. Everyone's known that, you know, Technology would eventually evolve past the need for IVRs and move into a true digital agent, vir virtual agent experience. But now I think it will be undeniable as LLMs begin to run voice conversational experiences that the IVR, you know, it will seem like the equivalent of like a wax phonograph cap uh, capsule, you know, playing a record off an old wax cylinder. So I'll dive into these big principles of what goes into voice conversation design. And I'm gonna to try to present them in a way where it's clear what is derived from what, and what follows from the previous principle. So at the finest level of the principles of VUI design, we have turns. And turns are just basically the units of exchange between two, two or more, really, conversational partners. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, it can be, you know, conversational ping pong. Hey, how are you? I'm feeling fine. That was, those were two turns, but it can be necessary for one conversational partner to hold on to turns uh, for multiple successive turns, you know, saying something to preface what you're about to ask or giving a long-winded explanation that, you know, concludes with a summary that someone is expected to react to. But at its core, regardless of the content of what is said in a conversation, one layer down from that is you have turns are the fundamental structure of a conversation. Oh, and I meant to pause uh, one slide back. That was the introductory content. Does anyone have any questions about the beginning of the talk? Nothing from the chat? All right, that's cool. So here are some example turns, if it wasn't clear enough already. Uh, an agent could offer up, what was the name of your first pet? Takes a turn and then yields the floor for the uh, conversational partner to take a turn. What was the name of your first pet? Customer. I have never had a pet in my entire life. Leaving the space open for the agent to reply, let's try something else. So that's an example of, you know, things not going well in a turn, but turns uh, happening nonetheless. Okay, so in the voice space, what is the consequence of taking turns with a partner? Voice space, nothing gets written down. So the ruling constraints that we have on this medium are linearity and ephemerality. And these are such adjacent concepts, like they're not twins, but they're definitely siblings. I can't really separate them in practice in voice conversation design. 
they make the stakes very much higher for this mode of interaction simply because nothing gets recorded. So linearity mostly refers to time linearity. As we experience it, at least time marches forward in one direction as we exchange turns in a conversation. They're not all presented before us. We don't, can't, you know, can't move backwards without actually stopping and resetting and then moving forward in a single direction again. And then ephemerality means that like there is no stored record beyond maybe just our memories of what was said in the conversation. Compare that to having a chat conversation um, or an email conversation with either a digital partner or another human, the record is there and you could see, you know, you can keep one eye on, you know, what was said a couple turns before, you don't need to retain it in your memory. In voice, you know, whether it's in person or over the phone or through something like a smart speaker, no record. No record is presented, you know, to the conversational partners in real time. So ephemerality just means that our words are vanishing and that if we need special effort to retain things that were said earlier in the conversation, we need to account for that. And basically, you know, that comes up all the time in human to human conversations, you know, like, wait, what? I got something wrong several steps ago. What did you say? You know, when's the party? What's going on? And, you know, requiring to reset the conversation and march through in a single direction again. So those are the things that we always need to be mindful for in designing a voice conversation. Uh, it's pretty easy to remember simply because we are just mimicking human to human conversations that we've had all our lives. But, you know, when the stakes are high and we're actually mapping out a design document for a conversation, these, you know, the actual consequences of linearity and ephemerality need to be in our head all the time. So what is derived from linear, linearity and ephemerality? What is the actual consequence of that in conversation? And that is the inescapable truth, our ever-present partner, cognitive load. And cognitive load, in short, is just basically the demand placed on our memory at any given time. Why is it higher in voice conversations? Because of linearity and ephemerality, there's no ever-present record that we can refer to with our eyes to see you know, what was said. We have to ask each other, uh, what was the thing? Or, you know, apologize, say, I don't remember. Like, you gave me a confirmation code for my order in your previous conversational turn. I didn't write it down. It's gone now. Can you repeat it? And it's not just about, you know, retaining factoids from a conversation. Cognitive load needs to be managed in, you know, just say that a task which doesn't require any, you know, like significant precise bits of information, you know, maybe just, um, getting a series of permissions from someone, asking them, you know, reading off some, some legal documentation that an agent is required to read, um, just, you know, various steps that you march through. Not everyone has the same memory, and you need to be able to account in conversation design for, the, for those differences in memory. People can just lose the plot, and there's no shame in that. If you're doing something over the phone with no written record, people may, you know, their mind wander, thinking about what they're having for dinner tonight they can forget like, wait, which part of the overall task were we doing again? It's been like six steps and I forgot. Or, you know, just plain, like, I completely forgot why I even called you Grace. These things happen. So it's very easy to underestimate cognitive load. Um, it's kind of one of the pitfalls of a conversation designer is designing to your own experience. So it's good to be ever mindful of the fact that people have People, you know, people would just even be sleep deprived. There are huge differences in memory capability. We shouldn't take anything for granted. And, you know, constant reminders, almost to the point of being overbearing, uh, are a good way of managing co uh, cognitive load. And then, you know, through iterative design, when you put your voice agent out into the world and it talks to real people, you could scale that up or back based on, you know, how 99% of the population is performing uh, under cognitive load in your interaction. So, kind of alluded to this just now. But what is, what is our champion in the fight against the unending war against cognitive load? And what I call signposting. You'll hear a lot of, you'll hear a lot of uh, terms for this. Conversational markers is another one. But signposting conversational markers are somewhat unique to, to agents who work in the voice space, both humans and especially for digital agents because of the linearity and ephemerality means that it's very helpful to dice up and dice up the conversation and provide reminders of where you are. Not just how far you've progressed, but what the next objective in your journey is. So we reduce the consequences of linearity and ephemerality by saying, okay, next I need to authenticate you. 
I, first, I need your date of birth. OK, thank you for your date of birth. Now I need the last four digits of your social security number. So chopping up the interaction that way and making it very clear manages linear, linearity and ephemerality. And then ease it as cognitive load because it kind of reduces the time between the need for recall or action and the objective of the task. So you, know, you could say at the beginning, OK, I am going to handle that for you, but I need to get verify your identity. There'll be steps x, y, and z. And then you could march through your steps, getting all that information. Bad way to handle it, because people could forget you know, this laundry list of objectives you set for them, and then wonder, like, wait, why are you asking for my social security number? Signposting at appropriate intervals, which we also, you know, we determine those intervals through iterative design and seeing how people are interacting with our bot. Uh, just reduces that time between saying, hey, this is what I'm going to need from you. This is what's expected from you in your turn, when it is your turn to speak. And, and you know, people retain information much more easily that way. And where it's particularly important for digital agents is that, unsurprisingly, um, that you will encounter users who are inherently distrustful of digital agents. Not necessarily for the philosophical reasons pertaining to like high-minded things like personhood, like can I treat this machine as a person? Where does consciousness start? Some people, I'm sure, feel that way. But there is just a perception that you know, human, the machines aren't quite at human capability yet. They may never be. People get concerned when they're doing these high-stakes interactions in voice space, thank you, linearity and ephemerality, then the machine might drop the ball. You can always ask a human, hey, really quickly, did you get that? You know, these, um, these little conversational fillers and checkups that you know, fluent, people fluent in the same language would do effortlessly, you can't really bank on the machine being able to do that well. Maybe the machine can, but it's first time, your first time talking to a particular agent. There's just all sorts of uh, ways for doubt to creep in about the machine's capability. So when we add signposting to the interaction, people get this constant reminder that the machine is doing things well and taking their interactions seriously, and most importantly, handling the information expressed in their conversational turns with due diligence, respect, and care. Anyway, I'm a big fan of signposting. There's a reason I call it the champion. Um, I would, in designing conversational experiences, I err on the side of signposting too much and then dialing it back if people start getting frustrated, which we might hear in their tone, or people digressing in the conversation saying, like, yeah, you're talking too much. Always easier to dial it back. That's a much better negative outcome than someone having no idea where the conversation is and getting frustrated with the digital agent. So this, in a way, is the big one. I call error recovery the heart and soul of designing for voice. Um, there is an old maxim about all kinds of writing that writing is rewriting. And I think for voice design, the equivalent of that is that conversation design is error recovery. And what I mean by that is like we're still designing for machines capable as they are, they can mess up in ways that humans can't. They can mess up in a very broad set of ways. So you know, talking human to bot, especially because the medium of, like, say, a phone call itself can also be the source of miscommunications, even human to human, things go wrong all the time. I have never once listened to even a very successful interaction between a human being and a digital agent that didn't have some sort of flub. And you know, it could have been you know, the exact same thing that would happen human to human, but you know, there are bumps in the road. Everyone makes mistakes, humans and machines. So errors are ever present. And what's interesting is that they will always surprise you. Um, conversation design as a vocation, you can never really achieve true mastery, I feel, because the more you do it, the more you realize that human beings can communicate in ways you did not anticipate, and that will never not be the case. Uh, have a digital agent make 1,000 calls. You might get 10 calls that are utter disasters because of some unforeseen communication difference that you didn't anticipate. You can work that into your toolkit, be better about the next interaction you design, but you know that pattern will repeat. Language evolves. Uh, we can't, uh, you know, we can never design a human ag uh, digital agent that will really keep up with the rate that you know vernaculars all over the United States and all over the world evolve. So. Mistakes will happen. That's why 
error recovery and designing your digital interactions to be really robust is something that you know runs and should inform like really every step of the design process when you're designing for voice interactions. Um, and just a final note on that, it is also incredibly tedious, error recovery. Typically, voice design will begin with what we call building out the happy path. That's true of other design uh, disciplines as well. But it can be a very joyful process to design out a voice interaction um, that displays what happens when everything goes perfectly well. That's very tremendously satisfying for conversation designers. And then no one ever really wants to have to go back through and manage error recovery and plan for all the ways things could go wrong and make sure that, you know, a unique question that's very high stakes doesn't have additional parameters where things can go wrong that you're controlling for. It's the grunt work of conversation design, but it's absolutely necessary. So if I have one single unifying piece of advice about how to design uh, for voice interactions, just do your error recovery. Just bite the bullet and do it. So what are the sources of errors that I've been droning on about? Um, at their core, they go back to the technologies I missed earlier, and we can categorize them in the same way. ASR errors are when the machine misrecognizes something that the human has spoken, um, sometimes to comedic effect, but most of the time just you know temporarily derailing the conversation. Uh, NLU confusion, where someone like may speak something, someone may speak in you know a dialect to express their intent in a very you know very acceptable and rational way but it's just not a grammar that the language model is familiar with and may not know what to do with that. I may need to get clarification. And then, you know, we can also have TTS errors moving in the, in the other direction. No language, uh, no TTS model for speech synthesis is perfect yet. So machines can mispronounce words just like humans can, or, you know, somewhere there could be a ghost in the machine that just causes the TTS model to glitch out and say a word really weird. It happens, you need a control for that as well. And, you know, that would be controlling for the human being like, did you mean X or, you know, what did you just say? And then, of course, human behavior issues up, you know, an unclassifiable set of things that can go wrong. Someone could drop their phone, which, you know, could lead to an ASR or an NLU error or could, you know, start having a conversation with someone else in the room. And then, of course, technical issues where it's so maybe not with the, uh, with the digital agent, but maybe there could be a telephony issue. Um, just something somewhere in the digital process went wrong that screwed up the bot. So all things to think about, um, never-ending chase to make your bots as robust to everything that could go wrong. So side number two today that I want to talk about is, you know, what's kind of been implicit in all this that I want to make really clear is that even as the tools change, as you know, in ways to be seen that large language models are going to provide some sort of assist in conversational design, uh, maybe even you know, doing some of the repetitive work, you know, shoring up the dialogue that a human being writes, writing is still gonna be at the core of great VUI design. Uh, it's just never going to go away. And, you know, why is that? Well, because writing is just talking in another format and humans need to be the ones who are going to, you know, at a very minimum, be writing out the base level prompts, the base level questions for a voice experience, and the machine will help. But furthermore, you know, if LLMs lead to, the, you know, 50% of the dialogue, you know, humans write 50% of the dialogue, and then, you know, conversational AI fills in the gaps, you know, extrapolates from that and writes some prompts of its own, humans still, you know, you still need to proofread. I said writing is rewriting earlier, also true for UI writing. We're always gonna have to spot check what the machine produces for us, even if it's you know very, very smart at predicting what our needs are. So that shouldn't discourage anyone. Um, what I wanna talk about next is, you know, what are the inspirations and sources for what makes great UI writing? And I think a lot of people don't realize that through their hobbies or their other areas of study or even past professional experience, they probably already have that within them. So great UI writing is empathetic. Um, want to be able to give the machine plausible reactions to things people might say, especially if it's a business use case where the machine has to hear bad news a lot of the time, like I was in a car accident. It's concise. You might compare it to like writing for radio in this way. The machine can't 
be overly verbose. People will, you know, the there will be dilution of the information you are trying to express. And because of linearity and ephemerality, again, it'll be harder for people to hold on to what the machine said if you're using too many unnecessary words. Uh, it's anticipatory. So you need, that's basically, you know, in the writing dialogue for the machine, a good VUI writer has an eye on what the human probably said before and will likely say or could say, the range of things they could say next. Also collaborative. That one's a little bit harder to quantify, but the notion there is that when we're writing VUI dialogue, we can't lose sight of the process. We can't lose sight of the idea that this is a conversational interaction. Just because it's between a virtual agent and a human doesn't mean it's any less, um, any less a team sport than a human to human interaction. And imbuing the machine dialogue with you know, a sense of being a conversational partner rather than just like this weird, cold, abstract other, that was, that's what goes into uh, making collaborative writing. And sensitive to style covers a lot of different things. I haven't talked about persona yet today, but persona being you know, the character aspects of your digital agent that are conveyed through, maybe partially through TTS, like what is the actual voice that is speaking, but also in word choice. And what we see more you know, very, very commonly is that in creating voice experiences for specific customers in across various industries, it's very often going into a setting where there have been, you know, contact centers with, you know, tens to hundreds of human agents taking calls for decades at some of these older companies. And they've mastered their specific in-house approach to customer service down to what word choice to make when. So emulating, emulating not just the industry standards, you know, the difference between like a banker on the phone versus, you know, someone who is like an RN helping you triage a medical concern need to be able to manage, you know, the industry standards, but also just down to the company or hospital level, what have you, managing their specific kind of vocal branding and managing that in your word choice. So those are things that, you know, really only humans can do. They're all part of writing dialogue for uh, virtual agents. But where do we get, you know, what can we draw on from our knowledge as human beings? I have met, talked to, and actually been pe uh, people who have this exact kind of experience from this range of topics. Former screenwriters, former or current screenwriters make great uh, conversation designers. They're used to writing back and forth dialogue that conveys a lot of information. Same goes for all forms of theater. And I don't just mean stage plays. When I say theater, I'm including improv in that. Uh, improv has a principle very common that, you know, it's taught on like day one. It's yes and. And yes and basically points towards never blocking the conversation always basically setting up a next turn. I don't think anyone in improv theater thinks in terms of conversation design, but their principles are applic applicable to conversation design. So yes and basically means like, I have, this is my turn, what will your turn be? And then a reply formulated with yes and in mind would just be another link in that chain that continues on as long as it needs to. And then radio essays and journalism, you know, maybe in your, your NPR style for journalism and then say, This American Life for radio essays. Also, in some ways, even more than screenplays and drama is great preparation for learning how to write for VUI because there's a particular approach to how you write concise dialogue for radio that's just not just concise, but concise and formulated with the exact set of words that are going to be clearest and easiest on the ear when there is you know, no written record of what's being said. So. People from all these walks of life make great conversation designers, and if you have any exposure to them at all, you might find that it's really, really helpful knowledge the day you go to design a conversational experience of your own. And also, we are seeing more people enter the conversation design space who haven't done any of these creative vocations before. They're just come, they're, they're ready to take the next step in their career from you know, being a contact center manager or being you know, a frontline nurse who screens patients before they see a doctor, seeing you know, 100 patients a day. People who have these best practices for conversation internalized and can, you know, just, you know, kind of recall them and just imbue a bot with their, uh, their collective wisdom, they're doing really well in the conversational design space too. Which, you know, at the end of the day, what is it? We are just leveraging the experience we've used all our lives in having conversations with each other. 
and you know, just putting some formal structure or you know, contextualizing it within our heads by thinking about memorable conversations we've had before or you know, verbal disciplines in the arts that we've worked in, it can really help us a lot. So that is the end of my content today, but I want to give you some little challenges, as is our custom, that we'll go over next time. And I'll read these questions to you. Um, I tried to distill them down to what's really, really essential for getting started with conversation design. So I hope you have fun thinking through these. Question one will be, a voice bot must ask a human caller, what is your date of birth, but something goes wrong. And then briefly describe the next two conversational turns when the interaction suffers from, first, an automatic speech recognition error. So if, remember, that is if something is, if a word is misrecognized, word is misidentified. And then what happens if there's a natural language understanding error, something that is just not parsed grammatically or its meaning is not clear to the virtual agent for some reason. And then a text-to-speech error. Humans don't do text-to-speech. We just call that speech. So if, uh, if the bot said something incorrectly, what happens? And then, uh, unsurprisingly, there's a signposting type question in here. In the enrollment process for a new customer, a virtual agent must ask 10 mandatory questions. Write signposting dialogue just for the virtual agent, which aims to prepare the customer for this part of the conversation. Consider addressing the duration, difficulty, necessity, and who knows what else of the task. So please do those, because I think they'll be fun. Um, I'm curious to see what you all come up with. And I think Phoebe preceded me in the lecture, so I think it's time to bring Phoebe up the stage to talk about her answers from last time. So there aren't really answers from last time since they were mostly like go do a thing style questions. So I hope you did the thing. Um, does anyone, did anyone do the thing and has like uh, observations that they found about how their like tone um, prosody changed with different kind of sentences or tested it with Alexa or anything? That's cool too. Um, there's kind of a follow-up question in that if you do want to listen to our voice bot, um, which is the, what we've kind of been talking about a bit, uh, you can go to the website and there's a demo on there. Um, but I would like to invite Cooper back to the stage uh, to take any questions. All right, any questions from the virtual audience or from my esteemed colleagues in the in-present? Yes, Tiffany, what's up? The question here was, for different use cases, are there different conversational designs? And I'm guessing you mean different methodologies or you know, maybe different contexts for thinking about the design. There are, um, but you know, I don't, I think as we design across different use cases, and a use case here means, you know, is, is in our case, is Grace a virtual agent who is running the front desk for an insurance company, you know, needs to sort people to the correct department for their query, or is Grace the assistant to a nurse who is just screening to make sure that someone's calling about a mild complaint versus transferring them to 911 because they're having a heart attack. Those are discrete use cases. The principles will remain the same. Like everything I talked about today does not go away just because the use case is there. But we do prioritize, you know, we might find that if we make design choices such as, you know, like tightening up Grace's dialogue, Grace will use fewer words and maybe a little bit more curt up front, you know, less, less opportunity for small talk up front if like it's very, gonna be a very time sensitive or high stakes interaction, which is like maybe that medical one that I just mentioned. Um, so that would be a variation in how we conceive of what the dialogue needs to be structured as and the word choices that we need to make. But again, you know, like the principles are shared across, you know, cognitive load, linearity, and familiarity. They are shared across all sorts of different use cases. So it really comes down to um, Differences in how we start thinking about what Grace is going to need to say and how she's going to need to say it from the get-go. Um, and those, you know, those are two different modes of thinking. Like, 
if you had to switch from designing one to switching to designing a very different use case in short order, you'd probably need a little bit of a mental reset just to switch between like two internalized voices for the dialogue you're going to write for, um, for the bot. Oh, and the follow-up question is, do we have to do the entire iterative design for different use cases? Absolutely, yes. Iterative design really is like for each individual deployment of a bot. You know, even if, um, even if say we had use cases, at different phone numbers, you could talk to different departments at a company, and Grace was answering the phone for both, and 90% of the knowledge stored in the bot was the same, you know, knowledge we had put there um, in our conversation design. We'd still absolutely need to see how real people were talking in those specific use cases and uh, in those specific bot deployments and redesign on both. It's like, we don't, yeah, we don't, as conversation designers, we just can't know what's going to go wrong until people talk to it. And making assumptions that in one use case, that for one use case and one that's very closely related but is distinct, like thinking they'll be like remotely equivalent is a huge trap to fall into. So yeah, iterative design is for every single bot deployment, even if it's very similar to ones that came before it. Yes. Yeah. So summarizing what I think the question was, uh, you know, in the upcoming LLM revolution, uh, conversational AI mid change, like we talked about, is there going to be, is there untapped potential that will be reached there for error recovery in particular? Uh, I think so. Yes. Um, I'm walking a fine line here between like not showing anyone's hand and, you know, things that are being worked on right now, especially because Things are being experimented on right now. I don't want to speak concretely about something that you know we could have a very different idea about two weeks down the line. But yes, as a conversation designer who's played around with generative AI like ChatGPT, I am very excited about potentially less need for like very prescriptive design and dialogue authoring surrounding error recovery. I think one of the ways that LLMs will help us a lot is kind of being a, a wider general net for things, identifying that things are going wrong and taking just some of that tedium and repetition and grunt work out of designing, catching errors, basically. So very excited about that. Sorry for being so vague, but that's kind of a necessity. We really can't overstate how much we are at an inflection point in technology right now. Well, I can't speak to uh, <laughs> to any other organizations what they are doing, um, but I can say with some confidence that it's it's probably about ninety nine percent right now. Just in that, conversation designers are still writing out a lot of dialogue and kind of the state of the art right now. You know, pre LLMs working their way into voice experience is that. Basically, there might just be some randomization of you know which exact response that means the same thing gets chosen, which is a really humanizing thing to do for a bot. I mean, you know, like here are three choices, here are three phrasings for this question. If the customer or the the human has said this, pick from one of them, or you know, maybe some you know even internal randomization of you know of the word choice. You know, being like broadly speaking, here's what you should say in this situation, bot, and then you know some. Randomization, you know, some scrambling of the words into, you know, a new set, a novel sentence that that still makes sense. So everything's still being written, but there are some, you know, depending on the bot authoring system that you're using, there are some tricks for, you know, randomizing to add some variability to what things, what exact utterances get chosen. Possibly, 
So the question here is about, you know, as I think the understanding is as LLMs get incorporated into conversation design, as we have the bots say more things, do we introduce maybe a new category of error, which is, you know, and let's call it an LLM error or a CCAI, um, no, sorry, a CAI, conversational AI error, um, where we've given the bot too much freedom to respond and it might say something inappropriate, incorrect, unverifiable, maybe make a non sequitur. Uh, that is, yeah. I mean, we see that now. <laughs> I mean, we see it just playing around with, with chat tools. We don't see it in voice systems yet, but you know, there's no reason it couldn't exist. So that's, that's not, I wouldn't say a drawback. That's just something that now is, you know, we're pioneers on the edge of something very new. It's just something we have to account for right now. And, you know, you, there's probably not a single use case I can imagine where conversation designer doesn't have a tremendous amount of responsibility for making sure that nothing that is, um, nothing that's, in, nothing inappropriate gets said. You know, especially in a, in a business context, inappropriate, you know, like not being too casual in our dialogue or, you know, not preparing a response, maybe accidentally giving a flippant response when someone says, um, I'm here calling about a life insurance claim. So there's that the, the responsibility to make sure that our bots do the right thing in those situations is there. And, you know, it'll just fall to the conversation designers in conjunction with our engineering colleagues to make sure that we, you know, put up sufficient barriers that the bot can't just say something completely unwarranted or that could be dangerous you know giving misinformation that's you know something that we should also be aware of and also like there's something you learn at the more you know real world conversations you design is that things certain things that must be said for compliance reasons basically like if i am going to do this take this action for you you need to make certain legal acknowledgements that I have explained everything to you or you, know, you are giving informed consent. You know, probably the worst thing that could happen would be like, for some reason, an AI not constrained enough, skipping over that, deciding, oh, we don't need to say that today. Um, I don't know why that would happen, but that would kind of be a worst case scenario. And it's just another one of those things that, you know, we need to go into this knowing that we have to control for that. That's a very good question. Um, the question here is when we talk about scaling up or down the amount of signposting that we do in a conversation based on you know how the bot is performing and how people are reacting to the amount of clarification the bot is giving, do we do that by writing more or less, um, you know, more or less signposting dialogue, or do we let our bots make the decision? Mostly, that's just you know needs to be a human judgment call based on looking at a corpus, corpus of sample calls, either through you know, user testers who have been briefed that they are stress testing the bot or you know, production calls to real people out in the real world who are just trying to get things done. Most, you know, that's, that's a big part of the conversation designer's job and that's most of what we're talking about. But again, this is kind of the, you know, the internal logic of you know, a bot document that is you know, the product of conversation design that drives a bot. Skipped over that today because of the looming LLM changes. I don't want to give you bad information. We can, as conversation designers, build in decisions or you know, increasingly just teach the bot to make these decisions like, based on what else has happened within a call, um, you know, maybe we could pick up on cues, like maybe someone we know someone's calling about a sad outcome that they're trying to uh, address, or maybe someone has asked for clarification at every preceding step, Grace could you know, make the decision to toggle on or off some explanatory dialogue based on cues like that. So that's really cool. That is a very, very nuanced level of design and something that also, you know, the necessity of that and you know, maybe the sensitivity to how often Grace makes that decision is also information that we could gain from listening to real people talk to the bots. But yeah, so 
dialing up or down the signposting just largely needs to be a human judgment call, but we can in increasingly cool ways give the bot some leeway to say more if there's some, um, some conversational standard that's been met. I don't think I'd ever want a bot to make the decision to say less. I alluded to that when I said bots should not be allowed to skip over like compliance statements. But yeah, I'm hard pressed to think of a time where I'd want a bot to make the choice to say less. I haven't seen it, anything come through on chat question wise. Okay, cool. Any questions from room, final questions from the room? What do I think is the new frontier in this brave new world? Which sounds like a question formulated by an AI, I might add. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about what I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think I've driven home the point pretty hard that error recovery is necessary and at times very boring to design for. I'm very interested in, you know, letting the creation of dialogue be the, be the conversation designer's main concern and, you know, well-constrained and well-trained AI um, scooping up, you know, running error recovery duty and, you know, noticing when things are going wrong. Still probably being provided instruction explicitly by the conversation designer about what to do under certain error types, but having to be less exhaustively prescriptive about errors and letting the AI notice them, especially as it takes more calls and becomes better trained. That's, you know, taking the, yeah, I guess that's probably just the general promise of AI that we all hope comes true is taking the boring stuff out of all our jobs and leaving us more time to do the parts that we like best. Thanks, everyone.